So this is the text verse. Hebrews 7, 16 says, Jesus has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent. You know what that means. The descendants of Levi became the priests. But he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. What tribe was he from? That's right, the line of the tribe of Judah. So he didn't make it on the basis of a legal requirement based on his descendants. It was by the power of an indestructible life. Can you say that? By the power of an indestructible life. That's who we serve. The competitors will always come and go, but he remains the undefeated champion. It doesn't matter what happens in one region or one part of the world. The truth is still marching on all over the world. Christianity continues to grow. That's what gives me hope for this country because bad as it may look right now, it's, it's always that way before a revival happens. People get comfortable and, you know, all the, all the freedom that we have. And now when we see it starting to slip away, it's time like, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're rising up and fighting back against that. And then it said in verse 28, the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath that the father made with the son, mm, two immutable things. Remember, he made an oath, which came later than the law. He appoints a son who's been made perfect forever. So that just really encourages me that I know whose side I'm on. And no matter what else is going on around me, we win. And I want to be involved in the culture. I want to know what's going on. And I want to, I want to have compassion on people that are confused and be able to come back to them with, a, with something, a spark of life that will give them hope and not all the headlines that are just constantly trying to push your button of rage. And that's why we need to stay grounded in the word of God, rooted and grounded in the word. Paul said it this way. Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid. And what is that? Oh, look at that. It got big on me, didn't it? There we go. <laughs> which is Jesus Christ. Can you say that with me? My foundation is in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for a firm foundation. Storms come, the wind blows, but my house is built on you. I want to be like that man who built his house on the rock and not on the sinking sand of the culture. And we have to be really careful because it could start drifting pretty easy. In order not to, not to rock the boat or whatever, they want you to sign something at work, you got to be careful. Just be careful. It becomes a very slippery soap very fast. Hebrews 2.14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. So Jesus agreed. It says in Isaiah, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, here am I, send me. Anybody else? Here am I, send me. Are you one of those? And Jesus said that too. The Father had an assignment for him. He accepted the assignment. He leaves the perfect place of heaven, comes into a sinful earth, and agrees to live for 33 years, no sin. That's amazing. That's amazing. We sin multiple times every day. <laughs> When we judge people and we do things that, you know, we know aren't perfectly living up to the standard that we would like to have. He doesn't condemn us for it, but he loves us. So when we're obedient, we, we're blessed. We get the blessing. It says, he himself likewise shared in this same flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. That sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? And it says that in, in scripture that what's foolish to the world is the wisdom of God, Right? His wisdom looks foolish to them. But when, you, when the light goes on inside and you recognize, no, to be submitted to the creator of the universe who then sends his spirit to live inside of me, there's nothing the world could offer that could be better than that. But he had to die first. He had to become just like us, be tempted just like us, live through every temptation without sinning, and then die to defeat the power of death. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Does that remind you of COVID? <laughs> release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to the tyranny, to the bondage of that fear of death. And I mentioned this on Sunday, and I, you know, I only found out this afternoon that I was going to be sharing tonight, so I'm repeating a little bit. But the letter to the American church is written by Eric Metaxas. 
And you may know that he was the one who wrote this New York Times bestseller. I mean, look at that on, on um, Amazon. 7,000 reviews, all five-star reviews. Like even the people that weren't Christians or whatever, you know, it's just a classic work. I highly recommend it. Tons of lessons in there for us today. One of them was that he was here in New York City. He's a German, and a German citizen came here to go to ministry school, and he made friends with an African-American man who lived in Harlem, and he used to go up from Manhattan where the college was that he was attending, and he would go into the gospel services, and, and he had never heard gospel music before, and he was blown away. It, it took him a while to loosen up that religious aspect that he had from the, the culture that he grew up in, but he felt so much life in the music and then he would go out for coffee with his friend and he would see the persecution of the bias and the prejudice that was shown against his friend. And the light bulb went off in his head and he said, oh my God, here I am objecting to the bias against the African Americans, but this is what's happening to the Jews in my home country. And then there was this big wrestling match, you know, between him and God, what he should do, because here he is, a really studied man of God, and he's deciding, well, how could it be right that I go back and try to take out Hitler because thou shalt not murder? <laughs> but if I don't go, he's going to murder more people. And he, in the book, just does a brilliant job of describing that tension. He ultimately decides to go and did not make it and was uh, killed by the Germans because of that. And on his way to the gallows, when they told him it was time to go, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's one of those heroic things that people say, like, I'm going to be more alive later today than I am right now. You know, he really believed in it and was willing to give his life for it. And, and I'm saying that because what, what he does with the book on the left, The Letter to the American Church, is paint the picture that much like in Nazi Germany, there was a real struggle going on and that we better be careful. And, and take the, uh, sorry, went a little too fast, and take the warning, right? So basically there were 18,000 churches in Germany at the time. This is the, the, what the research said. Roughly 3,000 of them were, were willing to resist what, what Hitler was doing and take a stand. 3,000 were willing to just completely go along with it, and 12,000 were in the middle. And that's almost always how decisions get made in countries. It's not the people that are, are very bought into whatever that ideology is, it's the ones in the middle, right? That could be us here. I mean, I hope to God that we're in the, in the group that wants to do it God's way, no matter what that, no matter what that price is going to be. You don't know until you get, until you face the consequences, but I sure don't want to be in, in the one that looks the other way. And, you know, there's, you probably have all heard this story though, of when the Jews were in the trains being taken to Auschwitz and all the different concentration camps, the trains were going right through the villages in, in Holland and Germany, and they could hear the people screaming. They would just play louder. They would just play the music louder and just sing louder until the train went by. You know, and we got to be careful. I'm not trying to get, lay a guilt trip on anybody. I'm really not. I'm just saying, when we look in the mirror, that's where this whole thing has to start. Like, what do I believe, and what am I willing to take a stand for? Because a lot of the churches in America are sure seeming to be looking the other way and just turning up the music and saying, oh, well, we shouldn't get involved with, with the culture until it threatens our children. Like, and now it is threatening our children. Like, don't even want to go into all the details of that. You could do your own research on that. But the other ironic thing was that he wrote this book called Amazing Grace, which was about William Wilberforce, also a bestseller, in, in the secular culture. Not well known prior to this that he was the one that ended slavery in England before we ended slavery in America. So all the groundbreaking work that he did, and I'll tell you, it was difficult. You can read the book again. It's just brilliantly written by this strong Christian, Eric Metaxas. But the problem, he draws the parallel in Letter to the American Church that just like churches in Germany, when the Nazis were taken over, were looking the other way. The church in England was also looking the other way. I wonder why. Well, because slavery was such a big part of the economy. And it was easier for the churches to take the donations from the wealthy business owners, but those wealthy business owners had slaves. So when do we look in the mirror and say, what do I believe in and what am I willing to take a stand for? We don't want to put our families at risk financially. I, I understand all those things. I, I think I do. We, we don't really know until we face that challenge, but 
I don't know that there's really anything to relate Christianity and cowardice. It's all about courage. It's all about speaking truth into power and, and doing it in love. Yes, speak the truth in love, but I don't want to be one of those people that, that cringe and turn away. It says in the New Testament that he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. Now, fear of stepping off a curb where there's a truck coming, that's probably healthy. <laughs> so I want to throw the whole thing in, in, in one category. But living in fear about what man can do to me when we know what God will do for us and is doing for us, that's, that's something that we all have to tangle with, right? So I don't know. I'm, I'm throwing in a, a bunch of different ingredients into the stew tonight, okay? Anybody know what the Stanford prison experiment was? This happened back in the early 70s. Not one person. Okay, I got one over here, one over here. Uh, hard to believe. So they took some, uh, one of the professors there, took students to do an experiment. Some were going to be guards and some were going to be prisoners. And they wanted to do a two-week study on the behavior of what goes on between prison guards and inmates. And it's under that heading of the secular sentiment that doesn't believe what Christians believe, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? We, if you're a Christian, that's a basic tenet of our faith, that you cannot save yourself, that we were born into sin, and we need a Savior. Everybody agree? No tomatoes getting thrown at me for that one? Okay, well, the world wants to believe that, no, no, we're basically really good people, until we're not, right? And it's a nice thing to try to believe that, but none of the evidence would indicate that, and this, this experiment officially started the, the, you know, obviously, Stanford's a very well-known school, and they, the uh, Palo Alto police, which is where Stanford is, agreed, and they came and they actually arrested the prisoners. It wasn't going to be on their record, but they took them to jail. And over the next five days, the psychological abuse of the prisoners by the guards, quote-unquote prisoners, quote-unquote guards, became increasingly brutal. So what started out as a bunch of college kids just thinking, oh, we're just going to have another way to do a class, uh -uh, the ones that were prisoners started seeing what the guards were doing to them. And the guards started abusing their power. <laughs> Bad, like physical. And it, they forgot it was an experiment. It doesn't take long for the heart, for the human heart, to cross those boundaries that, that we all think we wouldn't cross, right? So another psychologist from the school, Christina Maslich visited to evaluate the conditions. This was a precondition of them doing this. It wasn't going to just be the professor in charge. She came in to see how to evaluate the conditions and was upset to see how the volunteer guards were behaving. So she confronted the man who had the class, Professor Zimbardo, and he ended the experiment on the sixth day instead of the 14th. Up to that point, he was looking the other way too. He had the evidence, but he was looking the other way too. So it's just one of those things that I think we want to have a reality check that we may not be quite the hero or courageous person we think we are. A lot of people that are atheists do think that just naturally we would, we would settle on a really good set of rules. Yeah, thank you for laughing. You know, it's laughable. Even though the culture keeps showing that that won't happen, there's like a reset button that people just don't want to believe in God having to be the answer. That's why Psalm 2 says, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Effectively, that Psalm is saying that the heathen are saying, God, get off my back. I don't have to listen to you. And, and it says that God laughs at that answer. And instead, we should kiss the sun. Right? That's the answer to success in life. So could a silent church in 2023 turn America into a national Stanford prison experiment? That's a question. What's the answer? My answer is yes, we could. Not a good idea. We shouldn't. And these are just pictures because they made a movie about this. It became so famous for the wrong reasons. They made a movie about it. And I think these are either movie pictures or real pictures of what happened. And this was the professor. And it made me think of this quote by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, which was about the Russian prison camps. The line between good and evil runs down the center of every human heart. <laughs> That's brilliant. He went into the uh, prison camps not believing in the Lord, and it was the actions of the Christians in the prison camps that got him saved, that turned him around.
because they had no reason to have hope in his world, in his mind, and yet they were helping other prisoners. They were living life with hope that he hadn't seen before. So there's something about brutal conditions that, that cause the, the benefits of Christianity to bubble up to the surface, also like the hiding place. A lot of you know that story, right? Amazing. Corey Ten Boom and her sister, just amazing how many people they led to the Lord in, in hell, in hell on earth. It would be hard to imagine anything worse, and yet they didn't back down. They weren't ministers. They didn't go to Bible school. They just, their father read the Bible to them at breakfast and dinner, and they worked with their father. They lived in the same house all their lives. They just studied the Bible, and that was the result. There's amazing fruit. So let me just think about some competing worldviews, okay, because we all have to deal with them especially people in the marketplace, especially it's kind of right in your face all the time, but we all have to deal with it. Great awakening or fake awakening? And you may or may not know that the woke movement actually started out as a mockery of the great awakening. That's, that's one of the ways that they got that word was an awakening to, of a different kind. We can either be a new creation in Christ in the kingdom of God, or we can live by the rule that the wages of sin is death. How many are glad you came out of that rule? And the gift of life is, is the acceptance of the Father. Salvation in God means you know that you're going to live forever. And the wages of sin is death is happening all around us in, in, in the lives of unsaved people. And that should generate compassion in us. We can have resurrected spirits or we can be dead men walking. We can be children of the living God or we could be these ghosted orphan spirits. Which is what I see in a lot of people that you meet and and you can see that they're they're bound by anxiety and fear and again not, not putting a guilt trip on anybody but it's the culture it's we we've had this experiment with all this social media and all this information coming at us for so long and it's only been 10 years so they didn't have any idea what was coming and the results have been the the statistics are horrible i'm not going to go through them all with you because it would take too long but it doesn't take long to look and i'm happy to talk about it offline if you want to ask me we can, go, we can serve the father of lights or live under the rulership of the father of lies. What's your vote? <laughs> Thank you. I can be a partaker on God's divine nature, according to Peter. That's what he said in one of his epistles. Everything we need for life, he has given us. And we can be partakers of a divine nature or we can stay stuck in that fallen human nature that keeps trying to do he think things are going to change, right? What's the definition of insanity? He's doing the same thing over and over and thinking things are going to change. And if you were ever addicted to anything, you know what happens. It's this law of diminishing returns. You keep needing to do more and more of whatever that thing, whatever that addiction is. You start out gambling at a card game. Before you know it, you don't even have money to pay the tolls on the parkway coming home from Atlantic City. That happened to me when I was 17. I wasn't saved. I drove down to Atlantic City. I looked through the seats in my car for every piece of spare change. I, I admit it. Arrest me. I ran the toll. Good thing I didn't need gas. Or it could be the day of Pentecost or the Tower of Babel. And, you know, again, anybody hear Jeremy Burden talk about the Tower of Babel? He gave such a good teaching on that when he was here. And it was based on we're going to elevate ourselves up without God. And we, we're going to get up into the heights without him. And no, no, you're not. So I'm going to confuse your language. But then on the day of Pentecost, what does he do? He unconfuses the language. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us a sanctified way to speak to one another. No guarantee, because you still have to yield to the Holy Spirit. But boy, I mean, it's not even close which team I want to be on here, right? In these competing worldviews. And then if you think about forward and backward projection, I won't get, I won't go long into this, but there's been a trend. You could think of it this way. A few years ago, people were getting canceled from their jobs or job interviews because somebody looked in their yearbook from 50 years ago and there was a Halloween party and, and a white person had blackface, you know? Which looking at it now doesn't sound like a great idea, but nobody thinks about it. at the time, that wasn't even offensive to the black people I knew, at least. I mean, I grew up in a high school that was about 50-50, right? And I played on the football team, and I was the captain, and I loved the, the best players, white or black. You know, Either way, it was great. And I'm not saying there weren't issues, okay? I'm not saying I could put myself in their position. But we have to be careful that we're not taking today's standard and today's values and projecting them back on people and expecting them to come up with the same solutions. No, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have the information available to them that we have now. All kinds of things. When we were in Rome, 
they were telling us that Nero died, went crazy before he died, of lead poisoning. Did anybody know this? You remember this, Lynn? Yeah, like half the people that were leaders, they had, they had water, right? They, they had all these great architects and they were building these aqueducts, but they didn't realize what the lead pipes were going to do. So the wealthy people went crazy a lot of the times, and Nero is one of them, clearly. But it was because of lead poisoning, right? They just didn't know. So I'm going to think back to my father, who's born in 1921, and I'm going to say, well, if I were there, I wouldn't have made that decision. You have no clue. That's what backward projection is. Don't do that. You don't know what it would have been like to be in that culture, okay? Now, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to give you a general principle. As Christians, we have this hope of the future, and we look through the windshield, not the rearview mirror. And we, we want to live our life every day comparing me to yesterday. Am I more like Jesus today than yesterday? And if the answer to that is yes, then I'm on, I'm on the right trajectory. Maybe I should be going faster, but at least I'm going in the right direction. I'm just giving you whatever wisdom I've accumulated over the years is that if we start in the mirror and we think of that, that chaff, right? He, he, he comes with a winnowing fork in his hand and he separates the wheat from the chaff. And the chaff he burns in the fire, right? And, and, and the kernels that he keeps, that's, that's the food that we have. If each of us look at that personally and say, maybe today I'll throw, up, I'll throw up the harvest of my life to the Lord, let him blow away the chaff, I'll pick that up and I'll bring that and put it on the fire of my heart, of my altar. And I'll use the thing the enemy was going to use against me to now fuel the furnace of my life. And in that regard, it's like a crucifixion. Right? And that's what Paul said. I've been crucified with the Messiah. I no longer live. Now, how many of you could say that? <laughs> Paul said it. But it's the old me that no longer lives. Right? I no longer live. This strong statement. I no longer live, but the Messiah lives in me. And the life that I am now living in this body, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. And you might say, well, that's the wrong translation. Because the one I have says I live by the faith of the Son of God. But I'm, I'm just trying, again, give you the experience of my life. There are other translations that take it this way, and people that I respect think that it should be expanded that way because I don't think the Lord was saying you have an equal amount of faith to him, but you have faith because he was faithful to his calling that he had. We can be faithful to his calling to us. I live by the same thing he did. I'm an obedient son, a faithful and obedient son. And because of that, I will prosper in this earth. I might be persecuted, but that builds character in me. Amen? Who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't set aside God's grace. My, my Paul was saying, you're trying, he's talking to the Galatians, you're trying to get people to think that they have to be circumcised. Even though they're a Christian now, they've got to go back to the law. No, and he says, oh foolish Galatians. Right? It's for freedom that you have been set free. And don't go back to that. I'm not setting God's grace aside because for if righteousness comes about by doing what the law requires, then even the Messiah died for nothing. Paul is an expert at trying to follow the rules to live in right standing with God. It's just he knows it doesn't work, and he's trying to help them avoid that problem. Here's a good one. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Now that could be a little confusing. I mean, he got crucified. So if he was heard, who was able to save him from death, he was heard. What does that mean? Though he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. I'm just going to throw it out there. You can look this one up and try it on your own. But here's how I think it applies to us. The wages of sin, if Jesus had sinned, he would not have been the perfect sacrifice. Was he tempted to sin? Yes. So if he sinned, that would have been a form of death because it would have canceled his whole assignment, right? So how hard was it for him to not sin? <laughs> it's hard. He was tempted in all ways, just like we are. A lot of people think because he was God and man that he had it easier than we do. I'm not sure. You know, if you can prove it, come, you know, send me an email. He was tempted and always just like we are, yet without sin. So here he's living his whole life resisting every single sin. So I'm, I might be stretching it here. I've, I've found other people that believe this, though. 
He was, with loud cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death, he was heard because of his reverence. So the father helped him every time he might have been tempted to sin. I could think of several times, if, if I were him, when I would have been tempted to sin, especially on the cross, right? And yet he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And, and if you think of suffering as resisting sin or suffering as having to do a really difficult job, a thing on your job, like I'm not signing this form. I'm sorry. I'm not signing the form. I've got a, a, a medical exemption from my church, but if you're going to say no, you know, I, I'm not signing it. All right? I, whatever the, the mandatory thing was that they were asking you to do. Or in New Jersey, there are school districts that are not allowing parents to let their children opt out of classes that are, that are, that are teaching what was considered pornography, illegal, when I was a high school student, right? Like, you're a teacher. Like, you know what I'm talking about. I can't opt out. Like, I'm paying your salary through my taxes, and I can't opt out. And I have no say over what you're, what you're saying to my child. No, no. This is America. You can't do that. That's a hard decision, isn't it? But being made perfect, he never did sin. He resisted every temptation. Am I saying that, that we're going to actually do that? Probably not. I get it. I know that we're not. But what are we aiming at? Right? What are we aiming at? We should be aiming for the power of this indestructible life. That was his power. He was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. Wow. Thank you. Good thing to think about when I take communion. I'll go, I'll, I see what time it is, so I'm going to go a little faster here. I'm going to go to Ruben, uh, Hebrews 10. Uh, it says, knowing that, all right, now i got to back up a little bit here. Think back, verse 32 of Hebrews 10. Think back to the days after you were first enlightened and understood who Jesus was, when you endured all sorts of suffering in the name of the Lord. Anybody suffer when you first got saved? How? Family, friends, people making fun of you, mocking you. I mocked my mother terribly. When she became a Christian, it was horrible. My father would get so angry with her, and she didn't care. She just kept on loving us and firing away, and finally I got saved, thankfully. But you, you do, you endure all, all types of suffering. But these folks were having it at a whole different level, okay? It says, you endured all sorts of suffering in the name of the Lord. Remember your compassion for those in prison and how you cheerfully accepted the seizure of your possessions. What? That's a different level of persecution than we're facing. Knowing that you have a far greater and more enduring possession. And I think that's what Jesus was. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He wasn't looking at the conditions. Think on things above, not on the things of the earth. The things you could see with your eyes are temporary. The things that are unseen are eternal. And I'm going to live with that eternal perspective, knowing that I have a far greater and more enduring possession than anything the world can give me. Remember this, and don't abandon your confidence, which will lead to rich rewards. Simply endure. For when you have done as God requires of you, you will receive the promise, as the prophet Habakkuk said, my righteous ones, the just, shall live by faith. My righteous ones must live by faith. How many have faith here tonight? We're going to serve the Lord. Let's stand. Amen. Let's just pray for a minute. Lord, we want to be those people that are, your, that are in proper alignment with you because of not just what we say, but what we demonstrate in our lives the way Jesus did, the way he was an obedient son. And, and your word says that he learned that obedience through the difficult things that he had to go through in order to be obedient to you. And we want to say the same thing here tonight. We don't want to be people that shy away from confrontation of the enemy. We don't want to be people that when we stand before you, that, that it's brought back in, into remembrance the, the places where we didn't trade with what you gave us, that we hid the talent in the ground, but that you wanted us to be about your business while we were here. And again, no condemnation to anybody in the room, but I pray that you would stir us up on the inside and recognize the season that we're in and that we can't just stand by and watch but that we have to engage. Whatever that means for each one of in, in here differently might mean something uh, opposite of somebody else, of what we're actually going to do. But, Lord, I pray 
that you would stir the pot on the inside. Could you say that, please? Stir me up on the inside, Lord. Stir my passion for you. Put a fire in my heart to be busy about your business, that I won't be neutral, I won't be lukewarm, I won't be sitting on the sidelines waiting for someone else to do it, but I'm willing to step up and step into the place where you have me. Now say this out loud with me, okay? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to think about, no, teaching them to observe, do all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Easter, you have the microphone there. Would you mind just saying a prayer for America right now? Because I know that's, that's one of the burdens on your heart. And can we just all just kind of agree with her right now? Maybe we can lift your hands and, and lift up our country. Some of the things that are, that are troubling that are going on. We don't want to get caught up in, in a hatred war. We want to keep looking to the Lord to solve the problems, right? He doesn't use physical violence. He gives us strategy. He gives us spiritual strategy to fight physical problems. Go ahead, Easter. Father, as we come before you tonight, Lord God, as your people called by your name, we come, Father God, with a burden for our nation, the United States of America. And that operative word is united. Father, we see so much division, Lord God. And we know, Father, that there's things happening in our nation. We decree and declare, Lord God, that we will be those that Pastor Peter has just preached about, those who will stand for truth. Those who will stand for truth, no matter what the cost, Lord God. We thank you and praise you, Father God, for the 50 stars, uh, the 50 states, Lord God. And, and we do. We, we pray for Hawaii right now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. All that's going on there and all that's going on in America, Lord God, it did not catch you by surprise. Yeah. Yeah. And you have us here as your ambassadors. And you are expecting us to be who you have called us to be. You've given us the authority to be your ambassadors here in the earth. And it's not about our will. You are the sovereign. You sent us as your ambassadors from heaven to be here in the earth doing your will. And Father God, as we have Many of us went out to Scranton, Pennsylvania, Lord God, to that mighty awesome gathering where it was said in the dream to Dr. Chuck Pierce that if, if we had not gathered, America would not be saved. And so, Father, it's, it's, it's not automatic. We have an, a part to play in it. And we carry the glory. Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for strategies, strategies, Lord God that are from heaven, not just out of our own thinking. We thank you and praise you, Lord God, that the strategies are coming to us day by day. And we are willing to stand in the strategies. Lord, we thank you. And we bless the United States of America. The operative word is united. And we give you praise and honor and glory, Lord God, that you trust us with your will here in the earth, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 So just pray right now. Would you please just pray? Lord, stir up a fire inside my heart. Yes. I want to be a I want to be consumed by your fire. I want to be like Jeremiah who said he had a fire shut up in his bones. He recognized who he was. He recognized the position that he was in. We lift up the state of New Jersey, Lord. We lift up the governor. We pray for him that you would make yourself real to him, that you would open up the eyes of his understanding and turn him from the path that he's on. The legislators in Trenton, Lord, that you would turn the, the path that the state is on right now with abortion and with the, with the curriculum in the schools and so many other ways that, that things are going in the wrong direction according to your word but we don't hate them Lord we don't we don't wish harm on them we wish them to get saved and that there would be a revival here and I take it as a sign that the miracle of, Ma of Madison Square Garden filled with Christians and filled with new believers next year is, is a sign that you're gonna move mightily in this region Lord we claim it as a miracle and and for just the, the overall uh, group of parents 
that are concerned about this new school season that's coming up, this, this first semester of this uh, fall coming up, Lord. We just pray for strategy. We pray for wisdom. Those that might be considering alternatives like homeschooling and, and hybrid models and, and all the different ways. We know it's expensive to live around here. We're already paying for the schools, but then we have to also work around that with, with these other plans. But we need crafty inventions, Lord. We need people with vision that are willing to step out and recognize, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You decide what you want to do. I know what I'm going to do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So, Father, we recognize in these difficult times, opportunities arise all over. And we ask you to give us eyes to see the open doors of opportunity that you give us. Not to only be with other Christians all the time, but to be out among the culture, using the gifts of the Spirit to bring truth into the hurting people that are all around us. We don't want to be numb to the pain of the people in the world, Lord. We want to be medicine. Even this place, Lord, where we're standing. I don't know if you guys know this, if you heard me say it, but it was started as a mission base and they were training women, the sisters that you see now, they were training them to go out as medical missionaries into the inner cities. They were trained medically. They weren't doctors, but they had a, enough training to go out and help people in the cities. And all the moms that had children that needed help were coming and gathering around these sisters and that's how the churches would start. That's brilliant. You find a need, you meet the need, and then people gather, and now you have a common ground with them. Amen? So I just want to read this last thing to you. It's not from Scripture, but it's based on scriptural principles. It's from a man named Malcolm Muggeridge in 1980. He wrote this. He said, we look back upon history, and what do we see? Empires rising and falling. Revolutions and counter-revolutions. Wealth accumulating and then dispersed. One nation dominant and then another. Shakespeare speaks of the rise and fall of great ones that ebb and flow with the moon. In one lifetime, he was writing this in 1980, I have seen my own countrymen, Great Britain, ruling over a quarter of the world. The great majority of them convinced in the words of what is still a favorite song, that gods who made them mighty would make them mightier again. I've, I've heard a crazed, cracked Austrian proclaim to the world a the establishment of a German Reich that would last for a thousand years. An Italian clown, I'm offended by that, but we'll let it go. That would have been Mussolini, announced that he would restart the calendar to begin with his inauguration. A murderous Georgian brigand in the Kremlin, acclaimed by the intellectual elite of the Western world as wiser than Solomon, more enlightened than Ahsoka, and more humane than Marcus Aurelius. I've seen America wealthier and in terms of military weaponry more powerful than all the rest of the world put together. Had the Americans so wish they could have outdone Alexander or Julius Caesar in the range and scale of their conquests. I've seen this all in one little lifetime and it's all gone with the wind. England is now an island off the coast of Europe and threatened with dismemberment and bankruptcy. Hitler and Mussolini dead, remembered for all the wrong reasons in infamy. Stalin, a forbidden name in the regime he helped to found and dominate for some three decades. America haunted by fears, remember this is 1980, fears of running out of that precious fluid oil that keeps the motorways soaring and the smog settling with troubled memories of a disastrous campaign in Vietnam and of the great victories of the Don Quixotes of the media as they charged the windmills of Watergate, all in one lifetime, all in one lifetime, all gone, gone with the wind. And behind the debris of these solemn supermen, there stands one gigantic figure <laughs> of one, because of whom, by whom, and in whom, and through whom alone, mankind may still have peace, that person is Jesus Christ. Amen? That's worth remembering. That's worth remembering. The, the ruling spirits of this world are losing their grip. I don't know if you remember me saying that a few weeks ago. So Lord, we have hope in you. Our fire is burning for you. Not one of us may be able to, to, to do mighty works, but together we can do amazing things. 
One puts 1,000 and two put 10,000. So each one of us, Lord, I'm raising my hand to say, here I am, send me. However you want to use me, Lord, I, I don't want to be cowardly and backing down in a corner somewhere. I want to be out front being willing to take a hit for you because you did it for us and we're going to return what you put in us, Lord. We're going to bring it out into this culture. We will speak the truth in love. Your apostles ask for boldness and we say the same. Give us the boldness to speak the truth into this culture and that we might see the revival and that we would have compassion on those people that are lost and hurting all around us, Lord, that we could bring them the solution of Christ in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.